Hi, my name is Seth Ladd. I'm a developer advocate with the Google Chrome team. Today, we're going to learn about structured web programming with Dart, the new open source web programming platform. Our goal is to help developers from all platforms build complex, high performance client apps for the modern web. That's a mouthful. Let's break it down. All platforms means that developers from Android, iOS, Java, .NET, C Sharp, C++, etc., not just endemic web developers, should all be building for the web. Complex means more features, more functionality, more HTML5 goodness, all integrated into your app. There's a tremendous wealth of new web platform features, from file systems to WebGL to CSS3, that your modern app can take advantage of. High performance is easy to spot. 60 frames a second, zero jank, zero hitching, zero latency, and of course, fast computational execution. Client apps means we want to see more business logic, more functionality living and running inside of the browser. Modern web apps use the server as a JSON RESTful endpoint with the business logic and functionality living in the client. Modern web means the rising number of HTML5 browsers. Dart targets the modern browser, which essentially means only IE9 and above, and the latest releases of Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Opera, and of course, the mobile web browsers like Mobile Safari and Chrome for Android. This presentation will cover an, an introduction to the Dart platform and its motivations. We'll look at the Dart language, the different Dart runtimes and tools, and finish up with a look at the Dart community and the future of Dart. Let's get started. Let's begin with a high-level look at the Dart project. Very importantly, Dart is open source. The project is under a BSD-style license. We launched the project in October 2011 and you can find the code at dart.googlecode.com. We have a contributing guide to help you send patches, and we've already received fixes and features from the community. Dart is much more than just a language. Dart comes batteries included. Along with the language, Dart also ships a wide variety of libraries. We have a core set of classes and interfaces for functionality like dates, collections, and the built-in types. We also ship libraries for the DOM, JSON, UTF, URI, math, crypto, and more. Dart can run on its own virtual machine, either on the command line or in a browser. We ship a Dart editor, a lightweight editor, that understands Dart programs with features like refactoring and debugging. We have a custom build of Chromium with an embedded Dart VM, affectionately called Dartium. This is great for fast development iterations. And most importantly, Dart compiles to JavaScript. Dart programs work across the entire modern web thanks to this compiler. Compiling to logical, sane, and performant JavaScript is incredibly important for the project. Dart runs on the client as well as the server. Dart runs in web browsers when compiled to JavaScript or directly in browsers that have the Dart VM embedded. Dart runs on the server via the standalone VM, which runs on the command line and can interact with sockets, files, directories, and even run a web server. We've seen how developers really like the power of using the same language for both client and server. And we believe that an end-to-end -end Dart solution will be quite compelling. Incredibly important is to remember that Dart targets the entire modern web. We can do this with our Dart to JavaScript compiler. Using this compiler, you can convert your Dart app into modern JavaScript, essentially ES5, for modern web clients running on desktop, laptops, and mobile. Dart is built explicitly for modern web apps. These are rich client apps that are offline capable. These modern web apps strive for a constant 60 frames per second and are written for browsers that support ES5+. Modern web apps use the vast number of advanced HTML5 features. We're not talking about interactive sites and pages, but immersive, fast, modern apps that users demand. It's important to understand that Dart is still in technology preview. We launched this project early to get feedback from the community to help us prioritize. We're still building out the platform and adding features and functionality. You should expect changes ahead as we refactor, but part of the fun is to be part of something early. Your feedback counts as we work hard towards a stable release. We've just looked at a broad overview of the Dart project. Now let's look at the motivations and philosophy for the project. As we know, web development is good. You can experience very fast iterative development with the reload button acting as your compiler. You can make a small change, reload, and see the results right there. The web is platform independent, with seemingly every device with a screen these days using a web browser. The runtimes themselves are getting faster and faster. And modern web browsers are on the rise. 
I like to track how many people can play Angry Birds in their browser, as that game requires a fast JavaScript engine, hardware accelerated graphics, and an app cache for offline. I checked Global Stat Counter the other day, so take this with a grain of salt, but something like 70% of desktop, laptop, and notebook web users could play Angry Birds in their browser. That's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of millions of active users of modern web browsers. Impressive. However, we believe it should be easier to build the apps users envision. We think it should be easier to understand the program structure of web apps. If you think about it, how do you even know where a JavaScript program even starts? Where is the main method? We think that it's taken far too long for decent tool support to arrive for web developers. Developers should have access to tools that help them find errors and bugs earlier in the development cycle. We think it should be easier to integrate code across different frameworks allowing developers to build more complex applications more easily. And we think it should be easier to work with larger teams, where you can't just tell someone where to find a method or what parameters to pass in. We think it should be easier to meet the new user demands of lickable, beautiful, full functionality applications that exploit all the capabilities of their device. We think it should be easier to sidestep the almost 15 years of cruft that has built up in the platform. Certainly, one of the web's greatest strengths is that the original web page still renders in today's browsers. However, for developers, there are a lot of dark corners and alleyways that we should avoid. There's too many old wives' tales out there that no longer apply. What would it look like if we could follow the golden path more clearly? So innovation is essential for the growth of the web. We think that Dart fills a vacuum and provides an option for non-endemic developers who want to build for the web as well as existing web developers that want to scale up to bigger, more complex apps. I remember a great quote that came out around the launch of Dart. No one has a monopoly on innovation. Think about the full title of the web, the open web platform. That first word, open, means that anyone can introduce a new feature or functionality to the web and have a chance to prove its technical merit and show how the web is enhanced by this new feature. For example, there are features of the web today that no one can imagine the web without. The canvas was originally unilaterally added to the web by Safari to some outcry, but today it's enabled some killer games and apps. With more developers building more full-featured, awesome apps for the modern web, we all win. Let's now look at the Dart language. You can learn Dart quickly. Dart is a class-based, single-inheritance, object-oriented language with interfaces. You can yawn right there, which is exactly the point. Dart is familiar. It is designed to be recognizable to an army of existing developers out there. Everyone from the JavaScript developer that loves functions and hasn't seen a type before, all the way to the Java developers that love building abstract class factory class factories. Dart is a language for existing developers. We got dinged a bit when Dart first launched because some people were expecting the next best Haskell. We wanted more than five users, so we designed Dart to be something that you can learn and be productive with with just a short amount of time. Here's an example of some Dart code. We're showing variables, lists, iterations, final, and even string interpolation. Even with all these features, I think most developers can grok this code. You're seeing the use of a list literal, the for in iteration loop, and one of my favorite features, string interpolation. Going a little deeper, here's an example of Dart functions and closures. Even though Dart has class syntax and semantics, you don't have to use them. If you're comfortable with functions, you can use them with Dart. Looking at this code, the type def here sets up a function alias, allowing our tools to better support when we pass around functions. Anytime we can help our tools, the more chances that we can be warned about potential problems and bugs early. The make adder function is a top level function, which creates a closure around n and returns a function of type adder. The main method creates a new adder function that adds two to a number. Dart's functions and closures make it easy to compose programs without classes. Even though you don't have to use classes, there are situations where you're really glad you have them. For example, today it's very difficult to share code across JavaScript frameworks. It's clear that many developers think in classes and want to work with classes. And most of the major JavaScript libraries provide a way to emulate classes. Here, you are looking at four different ways to make a class with MooTools, Prototype, Dojo, and XJS. 
A class from one library cannot be shared with a class from another library. This limits the ability to compose systems with multiple libraries and frameworks. In Dart, you can share and structure code across libraries and frameworks thanks to class and interface semantics built right into the language. Here, you are looking at a simple point class. A favorite feature is the constructor arguments sugar. The this.x and this.y constructor arguments desugars into this.x equals x and this.y equals y, a common pattern in most constructors. On the right is an example of a panel class from framework A and a menu class from framework B that cleanly extends the panel from framework A. This is an example of two separate libraries sharing code and building on one another. This leads to more code reuse. In Dart, you can reason about unfamiliar code more easily. For example, the JavaScript example at the top reads, the calculate method takes an origin, an offset, an estimate, and I don't even know what it returns. What is an origin? What is an offset? What does this return? Given this function signature, you know almost nothing. Of course, you can pray the developer left comments to annotate all the types of the parameters and return value. If you're lucky, they did, but then your tools don't know how to parse written text. Worst case, you're reading the function body. And if you're reading the function body, you've broken encapsulation, and you're in a bad spot. You really want to know what the method is, what you can pass to it, and what it can return. With Dart's optional type annotations, you can add inline types to better convey your intention to fellow developers and give the tools to help you detect problems and bugs early. Optional static type annotations is a long term, but it simply means you can use static types when you want to and leave them out when you don't. We created a system that helps you without getting in your way, a system that doesn't create an overly burdensome ceremonial type checker. Dart's types create an innocent until proven guilty programming experience. Dart supports duct typing, but there are plenty of cases where you want inline documentation for the consumers of your API and tool-based checks. We'll see how optional type annotations help us scale our code from small ideas to large apps. Let's look at an example now to the Dart editor. This is the standalone Dart editor. It ships with the Dart project. Let's use it to write some simple Dart code. Let's say that you want to write a game and you want two figures to battle. Let's see how that might look. First, we're going to write a main method. And let's say that we want those two figures to equip for battle. So equip for battle. And uh, I guess they're warriors. And we want to do warrior.equip. And let's say we're going to give them a new sword. Cool. So I save my project, and immediately my editor gives me real-time feedback. It says, uh, can't find sword, doesn't know what a sword is. Well, that's great. I know, before I even run the program, what else I need to do. So let's create a sword class. OK. Very cool. So now, in our main method, let's create these warriors. Well, it's pretty fun to have pirates and ninjas battle, so let's make a pirate first. I'm going to say equip for battle new pirate. Okay. And sure enough, my editor again tells me, uh, I don't know what a pirate is. Let's go ahead and make him happy and create a pirate. Okay. Okay, so let's just run this program. <gasps> right away, my, the runtime says, can't find method equip on instance of pirate. Hmm. Well, he's right. If I look, the pirate doesn't have equip. If only my tools could have told me this. But let's go ahead and, and, and let's make the program happy. Uh, we'll say it takes a weapon. And we'll say arg. OK. When I run the program again, everything works, and arg is printed out, exactly as we expected. But Dart lets us do better. And now that we have a little bit more comfort that we have these things called warriors, and they get equipped with these things called weapons, we can begin to solidify the design a little bit. Now, we need two things to battle, so let's create a ninja. Okay. And I'm going to be a little bit smarter this time. Print 
if you are reading this, you're already dead. Okay, but I want my tools to warn me before I run the program if there's any potential problems. And this is where the optional static type annotations come into play. I've more, I'm more comfortable now that I have pirates and ninjas and they're both warriors. So let's tell the program that they're warriors. We'll create an interface. And we'll give it a weapon. Interface is defined just the, the contract for a class. And we'll say a pirate is a warrior. We'll say that a ninja is a warrior. Okay. And finally, we're going to tell equip for battle to expect that a warrior is actually a warrior. And now, if I remove some code here, my program can tell me a warning before I even run that a ninja can't really be passed in here because it's missing some methods that are going to be called inside equip for battle. This is great immediate instant feedback that my system can tell me before I even run. So I add that code back. The program is very happy. Those warnings go away. And certainly if you're reading this, you're already dead and arg are printed out. That's great. So we've shown now how we can scale from a system that doesn't use optional static type annotations up to actually using the type annotations and how they give us these early warnings. This is great, but then you might be thinking, doesn't this lock me into some heavyweight design now? How do I move fast? How do I iterate? How do I develop further? Well, again, you can scale up and you can scale back down. So let's just use one more example here. Let's say that I want to introduce the wild card to my battle and introduce a zombie. Okay, so if I go ahead and add a zombie class here, and let's say he takes a weapon, but I'll print silly a zombie's weapon is his insatiable lust for human flesh. Now, my program is going to run, but it's giving me these warnings here. And I'm not certain that a zombie is a warrior. A warrior has a code, and zombies have no code. Uh, but I, you know, I want my program to run anyway. I don't want to have to uh, somehow jam in a class into some particular hierarchy ju just to satisfy the, the system. And so I can pull the type annotations back off, thus making the program more happy. I can run here. The program runs, it terminates correctly. You can see that a it, it, uh, zombie is, a quick, is equipped. But you've seen how we can start without static type annotations, uh, create a program as we're flushing out our design. As we get uh, more comfortable with it, we can add the type annotations. And the system gives us that early feedback and the early warnings. And then later on, if you're doing some refactorings or you need to manipulate the, the program structure, you can pull some of the type more, uh, annotations off. Uh, reducing the amount of warnings, even though you know it's all going to run. And then later, when you get more comfortable, you can add the type annotations back on. That's that scalability story that we talk about. Now let's turn our attention to the JavaScript puzzlers section of the talk. In Dart, you can rely on this not changing. Thanks to Dart's lexical scope, we know exactly which method will be called, given only the program structure. We no longer have to capture this and assign it to that. In this example here, when a button is clicked, the cool method is called on this, or the instance of awesome. This is the behavior that developers expect from their programming language. In Dart, you can expect sane for loops. If you know JavaScript, you might know what, the, what happens if you run this code. Here we have a for loop iterating over values of i and giving them to closures to be called later. When the code calls the callbacks, JavaScript will print 2 and 2, which is quite surprising. Dart's for loops have sane semantics for capturing values inside of closures. In Dart, the program outputs 0 and 1, which is exactly what you would imagine. Creating readable method calls is easy in Dart. You have seen those methods that take one or more booleans at the end, resulting in hard to grok code. Try reading flip flags, true, false, true, true what, false what. Thanks to Dart's named parameters, you can say what you mean more easily. On is true, up is false, hidden is true. 
Got it. A benefit of name parameters is that they become optional if you give them a default value. Here, hidden is default to false, which means you can leave it out, like the last example shows. A theme here is to make it easier to write code understandable by humans and machines, thus integrating more code into more complex apps and catching issues early. Web developers know that you never block the main UI thread. This example is something you never do. You never put lengthy or costly methods back to back like this. The common way to split up the work is to use callbacks that trigger the next step in the algorithm. These callbacks fire when the event loop is ready, thus giving the UI thread a chance to do other work. However, as you can see, these callbacks get nasty and nested, making it hard to read. Deeply nested and async code becomes hard to follow. Luckily, in Dart, you can use a future to encapsulate this pattern. A future is a promise for a value to be provided later. If each of the costly methods returned a future as a token, you can chain the methods as shown here. These methods now line up and become easier to read, yet still run asynchronously. A future is returned immediately, and when it has a value, its chain method is called, or then is called when the last future has a value. The future API is beginning to show up in more and more Dart code as the preferred alternative to one-shot callbacks. One of the core tenets of Dart is that it must compile to JavaScript. As you know, JavaScript is single-threaded. But as you also know, devices are shipping with multi-core machines. Concurrency is great, but shared memory threads is error-prone and hard to optimize. Dart programs can take advantage of multi-core through a system called isolates. An isolate is an isolated memory heap that can run in a separate thread or process. Because there is no shared state, you communicate between isolates by passing messages. Here is an example of spawning an isolate for an echo function. A send port is returned, which is used to send hello from main and wait for a reply. The use of then is a signal that we're using the future library. You can see the echo function waits for messages on its receive port and replies to those messages are sent with the send function. Even though Dart is a familiar language, we took this rare opportunity when designing a new language to fix a few things along the way. Isolates simplifies concurrent programming. They are inspired by Erlang's processes model for safer, easier to reason about parallel programming. The Dart VM natively supports isolates, and isolates compile to web workers for HTML5 apps. We saw this example when we played with optional static type annotations. The important point to remember is that the type annotations aren't there to get in your way. You can still write dynamic duct-typed code. This is especially useful when you're experimenting or testing ideas. You can get even more dynamicer with Dart thanks to no such method. If a method isn't resolved on an object, you can implement no such method and dynamically handle it. For example, this code exposes any JSON map as a Dart object and uses no such method to handle the properties of the JSON map as object methods. Dart is very much a dynamic scripting language. We looked at a lot of cool language features and improvements over JavaScript. Let's see how you can run Dart code. First up, running Dart on the server. Dart isn't just for modern web apps running in the client. Dart can also run via its standalone VM on the command line for scripts and servers. This example code serves static files via the built-in HTTP server library. You can also see uses of files and directories. Critical functionality for command line apps. The Dart VM supports a lot of functionality for your servers, such as files, directories, sockets, web servers, HTTP clients, and even WebSocket servers and clients. We believe in a vision of running Dart code on the client and the server. Let's see a demo of this right now. We're back in the Dart editor. Let's look at a simple Dart server. This looks familiar to the code on the slide previously. Let's make a small change so we know that it's all working. Hello, intertubes. We save the program. Our editor is happy. Let's go ahead and commit the change. And now let's send it up to the cloud. 
This command is actually pushing the Dart application you just saw in the editor up to Heroku's cloud. Heroku lets you run arbitrary applications in the cloud. And we've wired in the Dart virtual machine as one of those runtimes. So you see here the deployment processing happening in real time. Let's grab the URL from our new Dart app. Zoom in. Hello, intertubes. Sure enough, it's printed out. What you're seeing here is debug output from a live running Dart virtual machine program in the cloud. We deployed it in real time, and this is running right now. Of course, Dart is first and foremost a web programming language. Let's look at Dart running on the client. Every web developer is familiar with the DOM. Unfortunately, the DOM is a language agnostic interface and never feels natural to whatever language you are working in. jQuery is popular in part because it did a great job smoothing over the DOM and making it feel natural to JavaScript developers. Our fresh approach to web programming means we can take a fresh approach to interfacing with the browser. We've created an HTML library to make programming the browser feel like Dart code. This example shows some of the HTML library's features. Creating a new element is simple thanks to the use of element.tag named constructor. An element's classes are just a Dart list. So you can add a new class just like you can add anything else to any Dart list. The event handler is one of my favorites. On.click.add reads clearly and uses an anonymous function to handle the click event. Finally, we easily add the button to the body's elements because elements is just another Dart collection. The compiler targets ES5 JavaScript, essentially modern web browsers. Work has begun to perform tree shaking and dead code elimination, helping apps load and start quickly. The compiler itself is written in Dart. In fact, you can use the compiler to compile the compiler to JavaScript. We're working hard on generating smaller and smaller JavaScript and continued performance improvements. We've seen how to run Dart code. Now let's look at editing and debugging Dart code. The Dart project ships Dartium, our build of Chromium that embeds a Dart VM. Dartium is great for fast iterations, enabling you to write Dart code, make edits, and simply hit reload to see the changes. The Dart editor is wired into Dartium for a nice debugging experience. And Dartium has begun integrating the dev tools for Dart. Let's see a demo now. Here's the same code that you just saw on the slide. Now I want to show you this running in two different ways. First, when we run it natively, it'll fire up what we call Dartium. Dartium is Chromium with the Dart virtual machine in action. Sure enough, the button appears. When we click it, it tells us clicked. Pretty impressive. But the real power is the integration between Dartium and the editor. For instance, let's set a debug breakpoint. If we run the program again, go back to the editor, and you can see the program has stopped right where we set the breakpoint. If we continue running the program, the button is indeed rendered. So that's pretty cool. You can debug in the editor. You can also debug with the DevTools integration in Dartium. So here, let's load up the source just to show you that the program we're running is indeed the actual Dart code. Let's set the same breakpoint in the DevTools and reload in the browser. And sure enough, it stops exactly where we set the breakpoint. More functionality will be added to the dev tools over time, giving you full debugging and program manipulation capabilities. But let's dive deeper. For instance, in the editor, you can do simple refactoring, like renaming. Let's rename this button. Right-clicking on the button, let's choose clickable. And sure enough, the editor, thanks to the optional static type annotations, can find all uses of the button variable and renames everything to clickable. Finally, I want to show you how you can compile this simple program into JavaScript and run it on all modern browsers. Using the editor, we can go to Generate JavaScript from the Tools menu. This will now run our Dart to JS compiler. Now we can take the URL running in Dartium. We'll open up another editor here. Here's Firefox. We paste in the URL. Sure enough, the same application loads up and runs. This is all thanks to a bootstrap script that we include with each Dart project. This script here you can see uh, is both the Dart application 
that is the native Dart code in the script tag, but right below that is our dart.js bootstrap script. This will detect if your browser runs the Dart virtual machine. If not, it will replace the above Dart script with the equivalent compiled to JavaScript version for browsers that don't have the Dart VM embedded in them. So you've seen how using the editor and our tools, you can run a Dart program in Dartium and any modern web browser. As you just saw, the Dart editor supports more than just editing text. You can jump to definition, perform simple refactorings, debug code, and compile to JavaScript. The last tool we'll look at today is Dart's brand new package manager, affectionately called Pub. With Pub, you can install third-party packages into your application. Pub makes it easy to manage application dependencies. Today, Pub will install packages straight from Git. But in the future, we will set up pub.dartlang.org to host, discover, and install package snapshot. Using Pub is simple. Step one, declare your dependencies in a simple YAML pub spec file. Step two, run pub install to download and install the libraries into your application. Step three, import the new libraries with the new package colon prefix. Finally, deploy the kittens. Let's go to the demo. We're back in the Dart editor. Let's look at this simple web app that uses three different packages, cat picks, frames, and widgets. Now, you can see the editor doesn't know anything about these three different libraries, so let's help it out. We define our dependencies here with the pubspec file. You can see the three different package names, cat pick, frame, and widget, and pointing to their individual Git repositories somewhere out on the net. Once we have that uh, configured, we can go to the command line inside our application and run pub install. This will go out, parse the pub spec file, and pull in all of our dependencies locally right next to our project. Now going back to our editor, you can see that the editor has now resolved the different packages to their correct place, and a new packages directory is now here. We defined a dependency on three different packages, but we have four packages installed. This is because one package itself has a pub spec file, so pub will walk transitive dependencies. Now that we have our application wired up together and its dependencies resolved, we can go ahead and run it. And sure enough, your life is complete. You have cat picks in your app. And you can see the cat picks themselves, the widgets, and the frames are now all rendering. And we didn't write any of that code. All of that code came from third-party dependencies and libraries out from the net. This was all just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to the Dart language, libraries, and tools to cover. Let's see how to learn more. Our api.dartlang.org site has all the API docs for all the libraries that ship with the Dart SDK. We even have comments enabled for you to add your own tips and tricks. If you know JavaScript, you'll definitely want to check out synonym.dartlang.org. This site maps common JavaScript idioms, snippets, and patterns to their equivalents in Dart. Everything is in this page, from using arrays to numbers to functions, even how to work with the DOM and jQuery. This site came out of an internal Google hackathon, and we think you'll find it useful. Our Dart language tour takes you through the language in much more detail. This is a good way to get an overview of the language without reading the language spec. It's a friendly way to tour the language. The Dart library tour walks you through most of the libraries that ship with the SDK. You'll see what you can do with the core libraries, isolates, UTF, URI, crypto, and more. For a high-level overview of the Dart project, check out this free ebook from O'Reilly. This is a quick way to learn about the project from the 10,000-foot level. As you're learning about the Dart language, libraries, and tools, don't forget to join the growing Dart community. The community has already started to publish libraries covering everything from MVC frameworks to physics simulators to template libraries. More recently, we've spotted a port of PhoneGap to Dart and drivers for databases such as MongoDB and Redis. One project that really caught our attention was the Mod Dart project that embeds Dart into Apache. Not only can you run Dart on Heroku, but now you can run Dart with perhaps the most popular web server. You can tell the world about your cool new Dart libraries using Twitter, Google+, blogs, IRC, our discussion mailing list, and of course, Stack Overflow. Engineers from the project, as well as active community members, hang out on the mailing list and these other channels. Don't hesitate to drop in, say hi, and ask questions. So get started with Dart today. 
If you like rich code editors, download the Dart Editor Bundle, which has everything you need, including Dartium and the Dart SDK. If you like VI, Emacs, or TextMate, you can download the standalone SDK. Most importantly, please send us feedback. Now that you're all plugged into the Dart community and writing Dart code, what's next for the Dart project? Well, as we mentioned, Dart is still in technology preview. Dart is not done, and there are some cool new features coming for the project. Reflection support and often requested features being worked on. This isn't as simple as it may sound. We want to ensure that we can ship the smallest amount of code possible over the wire. So we need a reflection system that we can use to introspect and perform intelligent tree shaking and dead code elimination. Also coming is simplifications to equality, the pub package manager, method cascades, shipping Dart directly in Chrome, and our UI libraries for web apps. Other features like class mix-ins, also known as traits, are being discussed at a high level. Here's the summary as we wrap up. Today, we learned that Dart compiles to modern JavaScript. Dart is easy to learn with type annotations that fit the way you work. We learned that Dart runs on the client and the server for an end-to-end -end programming experience. The Dart project is much more than just a language. It ships with libraries and tools like the Dart editor. Dart is under active development and has an active and growing community. Remember, Dart is structured web programming compatible with today's web. Please give it a try and give us feedback. Thanks very much, and thanks for trying Dart.